Remember that Dr. Levine is sharing his expertise and any information from tonight or questions pertaining to individual concerns should be discussed with your doctor. It is my great pleasure that we have Dr. Douglas Levine from NYU Langone Perlmutter Cancer Center. In addition to his clinical practice, Dr. Levine is the head of the Gynecology Research Laboratory where he studies cancer prevention, precision medicine, and rare tumors with unmet needs. He serves as a translational scientist on many national clinical trials, determining what genomic alterations are associated with response to targeted therapies. Dr. Levine has an extensive list of credentials, including work with the NIH, Ovarian Cancer Research Fund, Clarity Foundation, American Association for Cancer Research, and the Honorable Tina Brosnan Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Levine, for sharing your time and expertise with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone on the East Coast, and good afternoon to anyone on the West Coast. Uh, great. Uh, so I've, I was asked to discuss advances in the treatment of ovarian cancer, uh, which I'll do over the next 30 to 40 minutes. And, and again, thank you all for joining uh, us this evening. Um, and. The outline will be basically to discuss some of the latest developments in uh, surgical trials, <clears throat> medical trials, uh, cost effectiveness, and a review of uh, PARP inhibitors and their use uh, in the maintenance setting. And then we'll take some questions and possibly give some answers. So uh, just a few uh, bits of background before we get started. Um, many of you, you who've been uh, with us for, for a while, uh, know that one of the latest uh, bits of development uh, that we've learned in the past five to 10 years is that ovarian cancers are not one disease. Uh, there are many diseases. They come from different sites of origin. They come from different cellular origins, and they have very different genetic makeups. Uh, I like to say that the diseases in the ovary are as different as the diseases that occur in the chest. Uh, for example, you wouldn't think that breast cancer and lung cancer are really one disease just because they both can occupy the chest. And ovarian cancers can come from the fallopian tube, they can come from endometriosis, they can come from the ovary, uh, and they're very different diseases. <clears throat> We've learned a lot about each of these diseases, and in the pie chart uh, on the right side, uh, it sort of shows some of the genetic defects uh, that we've learned about in, a, in the most common type of ovarian cancer called high-grade serous carcinoma, the type that is w often what you read about when you read about ovarian cancer. It's the most aggressive, and it's the one that usually presents at an advanced stage, uh, and we know a lot about um, that type of ovarian cancer. The next slide here shows a depiction of where these cancers come from. And, and as I mentioned, we do think that high-grade serous carcinoma originates at the end of the fallopian tube, or at least most of the cases do. There's always some exceptions. Uh, the next two most common types are called clear cell carcinoma and endometrioid carcinoma. And we think that those grow out of something called endometriosis, which can develop through retrograde menstruation, where endometrial cells can implant into the pelvis. And that's very common, and every so often that endometriosis can turn into clear cell or endometrioid carcinoma. And so those are the most common uh, types of ovarian cancer. And tonight we'll mostly be talking about high-grade serous carcinoma uh, because it's the most common and it's the most aggressive. <clears throat> My keyboard. This next slide um, really is just a reminder for me to remind everyone that genetic testing is very important. All women with ovarian cancer or first-degree relatives, uh, uh, first-degree relatives of someone who had ovarian cancer, should be tested for mutations in BRCA1 and 2. These are called germline mutations that can be inherited, and these can be tested with a blood test or a saliva sample. Uh, they're generally covered by insurance, um, and there is protections against medical insurance discrimination. Uh, this. Uh, testing is very important because it can guide treatment. We have a number of drugs called PARP inhibitors, which work quite well in uh, women who carry uh, BRCA mutations and have ovarian cancer. And, and probably more important and most important is that BRCA-associated associ ovarian cancer is almost completely preventable if we do identify everyone who has 
a BRCA mutation or mutations in a few other genes, at the right time we can do uh, risk-reducing surgery, which will mostly eliminate the risk of cancer in those people. And BRCA mutations may account for up to 20% of ovarian cancers. And if there's about 22,000 cases of ovarian cancer every year, we can reduce that by 4,000 cases right away today if we were able to identify everyone who, had, uh, who carried a BRCA uh, germline mutation or a mutation that's inherited uh, from their parents. And so it's, it's very important for cancer prevention. It's also important that when we do identify a, a patient or a woman who has ovarian cancer and has genetic testing and is found to have a mutation that we then offer testing to all of their first degree relatives so those people uh, can one figure out if they're at risk as only 50% of those people will be at risk because there's only a 50% chance that you'll inherit a mutation from one of your parents and then if they are at risk we can discuss what preventative options are available including birth control pills and if they're not at risk that's a reassuring uh, sign that, that I I would imagine is good to know. Um, so again, I, I'm sort of belaboring the point, but everyone with ovarian cancer should be tested for mutations in BRCA1 and 2, and we're pretty good at doing that nowadays. Not perfect, but pretty good. Um, but we're not quite as good as making sure all family members get tested, and that really requires a collaboration between patient and provider. So uh, I think my last introductory slide is just that the general treatment of advanced ovarian cancer is to start with an, with, with an, with an uh, aggressive surgical procedure to try to remove all cancer that's visible to the naked eye. Uh, we can do this about 50% of the time, and about 75% of the time we can remove all large volume cancer, and that's good and that's helpful. <clears throat> and then it's only helpful because we follow it with chemotherapy that typically consists of a carbo and taxol or some type of taxane and some type of platinum agent given in combination. And most patients will go into remission after that treatment. And then frequently that will be monitored with either a CA125 blood test that's really designed to monitor cancer. It's not designed to screen for cancer. And for about half the patients or so, a cancer will come back at some point, and then it will be treated again with either surgery or a chemotherapy. And some of the studies that we're going to discuss um, will shed light on what that proper uh, treatment is. Uh, the, the one caveat is that, you know, traditionally we always thought that surgery was the best initial treatment, and there were some uh, studies to suggest that maybe chemotherapy should be given before surgery to make the surgical operation easier, and that's an area that's been very controversial uh, in our field, and there's been some studies that I'll go over um, to suggest maybe that's true or maybe that's not true, and, and as of today, we still don't quite have uh, the right answer. And so that leads to the first uh, study that was presented at one of our national meetings in early June called the American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO. And this was a study from Japan where they were comparing upfront surgery or initial surgery compared to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy means that you give chemotherapy first and then you do surgery later, usually after three or four cycles of chemotherapy. That's in contrast to primary surgery or initial surgery, which technically is initial surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. So adjuvant chemotherapy is when chemotherapy is given after some other treatment like surgery, and neoadjuvant chemotherapy is when it's given before. And so this trial um, comes in the background of a few other trials that I mentioned. So these trials you see here called the EORTC trial and the CHORUS trial were done in Europe and the United Kingdom respectively, and they did not show any difference in uh, giving chemotherapy first or giving, uh, doing surgery first. However, in all of the studies, there was a selection bias, and the outcomes of the entire study were really not that good. And we weren't sure if they were not that good because it was only the, the sort of the difficult um, 
uh, uh, cases that were put onto the study or if the sur surgeon's surgery done in the studies were not, was not so great. And so these studies were hard to interpret, which led to a lot of controversy uh, in our area. And so the Japanese uh, clinical trial group uh, took um, patients with advanced cancer and randomized them to have initial surgery or initial chemotherapy. And that's what's depicted on this slide. And their goal was to prove that neoadjuvant chemotherapy was not worse than debulking surgery. Um, and I'm not 100% sure that's the right question to ask, but we'll get back to that in a few minutes. Uh, and so they tried to uh, um, accrue 300 patients. Um, they needed um, to do this to, to show that there was no difference between surgery and chemotherapy. Uh, they actually did enroll 300 patients as planned, and you can see here they were pretty much evenly divided between the two arms of the study. And as expected, um, patients had stage three and stage four disease, um, which is shown here. And then this is an interesting slide about the surgical outcomes. And so their initial surgery actually took less time than when they did surgery after chemotherapy, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. Usually it takes more time to do surgery initially. And then if you look at this number, I'm not sure if you can see my uh, cursor here, um, but 37% of the time when they did primary surgery, they could remove all cancer um, that was less than, that was more than one centimeter. Uh, and they could do this 60 to 80% of the time after giving uh, chemotherapy. This 37% number is a little bit on the low side, um, so another uh, problem with this study. Uh, but when they did this, they showed, as expected, that when all the cancer was taken out, uh, patients did much better. That's not new information. Uh, but, but when they put this in comparison uh, between the arms, they could not show any difference between surgery first or chemotherapy first. But the one good thing that is shown at the bottom of the slide as far as overall survival is that all patients on this study did much better, almost twice as, as well as in the, the United Kingdom trial and at least 50% better than in the European trial. And so, so it was gratifying to see that this is a good a group of patients who have a survival of what would be, we expect in general, um, but still they could not show that um, the chemotherapy was not uh, worse than the debulking surgery. And so it was sort of a negative study uh, without showing uh, differences between the two groups. Uh, but again, not 100% clear this was the right uh, question. And so they're, they're concluding that chemotherapy cannot always be a substitute for initial uh, debulking surgery. Now, this is very different from a group, uh, a, a, a paper presented only in poster form at our ASCO meeting by um, the, uh, an Italian uh, group of investigators from Rome. Um, these, this group uh, of surgeons uh, launched what's called the Scorpion Trial. And the unique thing about this is the Italians are known to be very good surgeons. And so the, the investigators here are well known to us as a profession, and we know that they're very aggressive and they're very good surgeons. So what they did here is they only took patients who had what they called a high tumor load, and that was determined by doing laparoscopy, where you look inside the belly with a camera, and patients had to have a score of eight or above, which means they had to have a high burden of, of cancer. And so these were not easy operations. These were real, bona fide, major surgical operations. And they did this, and what you can see here, there's a lot of data here, but I'll just call your attention on the right side. You can see here that between 47% and 45%, which is over 90%, so 93% of the time, they could take out all the cancer that was more than one centimeter. And so that's contrasted to the um, Japanese study, which has only done 37% of the time. So this is more than, you know, twice as good. And that's just a reflection of, the, of this group of, uh, of Italian surgeons who, who are known to be very good surgeons. And so that, w that was gratifying. Uh, most patients have what we call upper abdominal uh, disease, which means extensive cancer. Um, and then when we look at their outcomes, they also fail to show a difference between surgery versus chemotherapy. Now, this is only a poster. It's not a finalized study. We don't have the, the full report, but they conclude, at least based on the data uh, to date, that neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery is not better 
than doing surgery alone or doing surgery first. You've heard me say a couple of times that I'm not sure this is the right question because most of us would believe that surgery is better. And so the question we'd like to answer is, is surgery first better than chemotherapy first? Or are they equivalent? We're not trying to prove that chemotherapy is better. We think chemotherapy might be worse. So we either have to prove that they're equivalent or that surgery is better. And the way you design trials really depends on what question you're trying to answer. And I'm not 100% sure that either of these studies were, were necessarily asking the right question. But so far, and particularly this, this early data from the Italian group, suggests that for patients who have a high burden of cancer, that maybe surgery is not better than giving chemotherapy first. However, with all the data that's available today, the controversy still continues. Uh, if you ask 10 different G1 oncologists, you'll get 11 different answers. Um, and it really uh, speaks to the fact that these types of treatments have to be individualized. Um, and every patient is different and every cancer is different and where the cancer is located and where the surgeon is located both play an important factor in what is best for both the patient and for um, the situation. So moving away from initial surgery, the next trial, uh, which is an American trial from the gynecologic oncology group that has been renamed the NRG oncology group, uh, was asking two questions. This was a randomized phase three trial called uh, two, uh, 213. Um, and the background here uh, is whether uh, Bevacizumab is helpful in treating recurrent cancer. That's a drug that targets blood vessels. And whether surgery is also beneficial for patients when cancer comes back. This is in the background of something called a desktop three study. Again, a European study. The Europeans often do trials before the Americans can get their act together and do the trials, uh, possibly due to uh, regulatory um, issues that we have in the United States to protect uh, patients and uh, doctors. Um, but this study is from a German uh, uh, investigation, investigator group, and they showed that when you also take uh, patients that meet certain criteria and you do surgery versus no surgery in this study, doing surgery did lead to a better progression-free survival, which is how long it is till the cancer comes back, but they do not have uh, a measure yet of what's called overall survival. So with that as background, the first question was, does the addition of bevacizumab lead to an improvement in, in overall survival for platinum-sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer? That's when the cancer recurs more than six months after the last uh, platinum-based chemotherapy treatment. And so uh, this is a complicated schema that I will, I will skip uh, and just jump to the results here is that there was a small benefit to receiving bevacizumab. Here it was on the order of about five months. And in this pink box here, it's really a borderline uh, statistical significance depending really how you do the analysis. And this is basically what every study with bevacizumab shows is that there's about a, a four to six month advantage. This is almost the first study that shows what's called an overall survival advantage rather than a progression-free survival advantage. And so bevacizumab works. It works pretty much whenever you give it. It works a little bit. So it works, you know, three to five months, which is good, but not great. Um, and there's no right way, you know, when to give bevacizumab. Uh, at my center, we usually don't give it initially. We usually give it when, when a cancer uh, returns. But the, the other question was, should surgery be performed uh, for recurrent uh, disease? And that was the question where basically patients who were surgical candidates were randomized to surgery versus no surgery. And that's the eligibility. Uh, there were about 450 patients, uh, I mean, 485 patients enrolled in total. Uh, we had trouble reaching the accrual in the United States, so we reached out to our Korean colleagues, the Korean and the Japanese, both have excellent clinical trial groups, um, and the, the Korean uh, clinical trial group put on almost half the patients onto the study. And so about 60 to 70% of the time, all cancer could be uh, removed. And the main findings were that there was no benefit to surgery 
uh, when performed for recurrent ovarian cancer compared to not having surgery. Um, a couple of other analyses showed there was no benefit in uh, progression-free survival, but keep in mind that only 60 to 70 percent of people could have all the cancer taken out, which was the goal of the surgical operation. So that led people to say, well, what if you could take out all the cancer? And here you can see this top red line is when all the cancer is removed, and the blue line is when all the cancer could not be removed. And there seems to be a benefit, certainly in progression-free survival when all the cancer could be removed, and that's, that's not something new. Uh, but on this final slide, what I'll show you is that for progression-free survival, when all the cancer could be removed, there was a benefit compared to not doing surgery at all, keeping in mind that all the cancer could only be removed 60 to 70 percent of the time, and this did not lead to a benefit in overall survival. And um, this was pretty well tolerated, uh, but it does lead to the conclusion that what we call secondary cytor reduction was not associated with an improvement in outcomes in general. Uh, there was a benefit when all the cancer could be uh, resected. And so this will lead to a little more controversy. I think most of us are still recommending secondary cytor reduction in certain circumstances, but those recommendations are a little more limited in light of this randomized trial um, that was recently reported. Again, keeping in mind these uh, this paper has not been published, and the reason I keep mentioning that is that the data is not really finalized until the, the manuscript or the paper is accepted for publication, because at that point, there's a very rigorous analysis of all of the st statistics to make sure there were no mistakes, and, and we all make mistakes, and sometimes we can make very important mistakes in clinical trials, and so just before something gets published, there's a, it's, it's about, it's, it's, uh, the analysis is done just about as rigorously as possible to minimize the, the chance of any uh, errors in the data, and that's really when the results are considered finalized. So moving on a little bit to targeted therapies, uh, this slide is just an overview of something called synthetic lethality, and that's the concept behind PARP inhibitors that are now FDA approved in many situations for ovarian cancer and now recently uh, for breast cancer. And basically, cancer cells undergo damage, particularly when they're subjected to chemotherapy, and they have different ways to repair that damage, and repairing that damage is good for the cancer cell, but not good for the patient. So the cancer cells want to survive, and we don't want the cancer cells to survive. We want the cancer cells to die and the patient to survive. And so um, some of the ways by which cancer cells repair DNA damage is by using um, a protein called BRCA, BRCA1 or 2, and another protein called PARP, and those are responsible for two different types of DNA damage. Now, if you have a BRCA mutation or receive a PARP inhibitor, one type of DNA repair will be eliminated. But the cancer cell has alternative mechanisms and the cancer cell will still survive. But if you give a PARP inhibitor to a tumor that is deficient in BRCA1 or 2, now the cancer cell cannot survive. And that's precisely why the PARP inhibitors work so well in the context of BRCA mutations. And that's what's shown on the bottom left on this graph is what's called a waterfall plot. And when the bars go down, that means the size of the cancer is going down. And here you can see in BRCA1 and 2 carriers, a lot of the patients, which is each bar, are experiencing tumor shrinkage. And on the right side, uh, here the bars are showing uh, patients with and without BRCA mutations. And this, um, this um, leads to the point that some tumors, even without BRCA mutations, will have a response to uh, PARP inhibitors. And so that's the basis for a lot of the PARP studies that have been done. But now we're moving on to do PARP studies in combination with other drugs to expand the arena of patients that will benefit from PARP inhibitors. So this was an early study looking at a PARP inhibitor and an mTOR inhibitor. Uh, mTOR is responsible for different types of cell cellular growth. And if you inhibit mTOR, certain pathways uh, will not uh, be activated, which can lead to cell, to cell death or death of the tumor cells. And this study was done in endometrial cancer, in ovarian cancer, and in breast cancer. It was done out of MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, this is the same slide that I showed before about how PARP inhibitors work. 
Um, and you can see here the, the patients were pretty much evenly distributed between those with the different types of cancers that I mentioned. Uh, and in the, the, the remarkable thing is that even in the, for the ovarian cancer patients, which I'm just showing here, um, many had platinum-resistant disease, which is obviously more difficult to treat, and, and most of them did not have BRCA mutations. And so this is not a group that you would necessarily think would be sensitive to PARP inhibitors. But in fact, when you add the mTOR inhibitor to the PARP inhibitor, 20% of patients will respond, which is probably a little bit higher than expected, and that was the same basically across all of the arms. For ovarian cancer in particular, there was a 20% response rate. Now, that's not great, but it is about twice as high as you would expect for uh, platinum-resistant ovarian cancer without, without BRCA mutations. So that was promising. It's not great. We'd certainly like to do a lot better and need to do a lot better. Um, but that's a good start for a unique combination that was pretty well, uh, pretty well tolerated. Um, however, a slightly more exciting study combined a PARP inhibitor with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So niraparib is a PARP inhibitor that we just talked about, and pembrolizumab is one of several um, immunotherapies that works through a mechanism called immune checkpoint blockade, and it really uh, prevents the cancer cells from hiding from the body's own immune cells and, their, and the body's own immune system. And so this was a study led by investigators from uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, another fine cancer center in Boston. Um, and here, it was only for women who had platinum-resistant or refractory ovarian cancer. So this is a very, um, these are very challenging uh, tumors to treat, um, usually not with BRCA mutations. <clears throat> and in this study, the idea is that activating, uh, creating DNA damage uh, may sensitize to PARP inhibitors, but it may also activate the immune system, and using an immune checkpoint inhibitor will allow the immune system to recognize uh, the cancer cells. And that's the rationale behind the combination of a PARP inhibitor with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And so there was an initial phase and then a, a more extensive uh, testing phase of the study. The study is called Topacio. Um, and 60% of patients had previously received bevacizumab. There were about 60 patients on the study uh, altogether. Uh, many of the patients had, uh, as, expect, as, as required, most patients had platinum-resistant or platinum-refractory uh, cancer. And most patients did not have a known uh, BRCA mutation. And what you can see here is there was a 25% uh, response rate. Again, for platinum-resistant cancer, that's not bad. Uh, it's almost border, bordering on good. Uh, I don't say that too enthusiastically because it's still, you know, relatively low, but it's, a, it's better than we have been doing. And so you have to start somewhere and go from there. And so this is a very promising study. And you can see from this waterfall plot that the patients who responded is a combination of patients with BRCA mutations and without uh, BRCA mutations. And so that's uh, fairly promising. And another very fascinating thing is that it really didn't matter if you had a BRCA mutation or not. Um, the response rate was about the same, which suggests that the combination uh, is doing something completely different than the PARP inhibitors are doing by themselves. Um, and so that's exciting for future studies. And this was also a fairly well uh, tolerated, um, fairly well tolerated treatment. And so um, this will go on for additional additional testing. Uh, the last the last main treatment study here um, is is specifically an immunotherapy study. And this is a pretty important study because patients frequently come in and say, you know, can I get immunotherapy? Because we've heard of so many great uh, responses to immunotherapy in general in many other types of cancers, including lung cancer, uh, colon cancer, brain cancer, uh, melanoma. You know, there's lots of really great um, responses uh, from immunotherapy. So, so a lot of patients say, I, wa I want to receive immunotherapy. And so this is a study that, again, um, 
was was measuring the response in in patients who had recurrent ovarian cancer. They had two groups um, based on number of prior treatments. As patients get more treatments, it gets more difficult to to be successful with those treatments. And so there was a stratification for the number of prior lines of treatment. Um, and they also measured the expression of something called PDL1, which is really the, the immune checkpoint blockade protein. And they used a score called a CPS, a uh, combined positive score, which basically counted the number of cells that express PDL1 with the idea that if you express more PDL1, you'll have a better response to these checkpoint uh, inhibitors. And so again, the only thing to note on this slide is that uh, a number of patients did have uh, platinum resistant or relative platinum resistant disease, uh, which is an important, uh, important factor here. But the response rate was only 8%. And so that's very low. Um, that's not really a great response rate. Even in the earlier group, you know, it was actually more responsive in patients who had more lines of prior therapy. There were over 350, there were 375 patients in the trial. This was a huge trial, and the response rate was, was not great. Um, however, for the people who did respond, the, the, av the median duration of response or, the, or the, almost the average duration of response was eight months. And that's not bad in this type of um, population uh, with, with lots of prior treatments. That's actually pretty good. And so there's a small group of patients who, who did okay, um, but the overall response rate is quite low, 8%. It's not that much better than we get with you know, other types of chemotherapy. So this is the reason why if you go to your doctor and say, you know, I'd like to get immunotherapy, I have high-grade serous ovarian cancer, he or she might say, well, we don't really recommend it because so far the single agent response rate or when we give immunotherapy by itself, it doesn't work that well. Now, it does work for a small number of patients, but it does have some serious toxicities. There's about a 1% a risk of death from immunotherapy. Um, there can be very toxic side effects. That was just reported recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so it's really a, a careful balance. And so in general, um, these, this by itself is not the most promising and most exciting drug. In contrast, again, to the trial I, I, I um, presented previously, where a PARP inhibitor with an immunotherapy drug, that worked much better at 25% compared to 8%. Um, this is the waterfall plot. And this is the conclusions that I basically just mentioned, except for the fact that it did seem that when the tumors expressed more PDL1, that was associated with a slightly higher uh, response rate. So theoretically, that could be a biomarker that could be used in the future to assess uh, response. The last uh, part here really um, asks the question as to how much does all this cost? Um, you know, cost is, you know, one factor. It may or may not be the most important factor, but certainly people who approve these types of drugs often ask that question. And so this group of investigators uh, did some modeling. Uh, and just as, a, as an example, basically most drug costs go down over time. And so you can argue that the price of drugs is really, you know, arbitrary and relative, and we all can make our own opinions as to why drugs are priced the way they are, and I won't pass any judgment on that right now. Um, but this does show that the price of Taxol has come down, you know, many, many fold from almost $1,000 a dose to $150 a dose. And in fact, no one really wants to do clinical trials of, of Taxol anymore because for the drug companies, it doesn't pay. And so therefore, they don't want to study ta Taxol so much. And we do have better drugs than Taxol nowadays, but it's a very inexpensive drug. And that's good because we use it a lot and it's quite effective. So these guys, uh, this group of investigators compared uh, a number of trials using a number of different drugs, including the PARP inhibitors, uh, bevacizumab, which targets blood vessels, pembrolizumab, which targets uh, the immune system, and paclitaxel. And here on the right side, when you consider the cost of the drug and the risk of complications, you can see the overall cost. And you can see basically PARP inhibitors are the most expensive drugs right now. Uh, bevacizumab is less uh, expensive, and um, 
and Taxol is really the least expensive drug based on how it's given the drug cost, the pretreatment costs, uh, and, the, uh, and the toxicity costs. And so they considered both response and complications uh, in their analysis. And this is basically the outcome in the top right. These are the most effective and the most expensive drugs. Bottom left is the least effective, least expensive drugs. And the bottom right is kind of the best. It's the, it's the most effective and the least expensive. And so in fact, bevacizumab and paclitaxel are much more cost effective than the PARP inhibitors. And this is, you know, somewhat informative when you're, um, I guess, thinking about healthcare delivery. Uh, for an individual patient, I think there's, you know, many, many considerations that have to be, have to be thought about. And so basically, because the PARP inhibitors um, cost a lot of money to get started because of the BRCA testing, um, and because they work so well, um, people take them for a long time, and that's really why they become very uh, expensive. And so just in the last couple of minutes, I just want to highlight a couple of things going back to the BRCA mutations that we talked about. Uh, again, it's important uh, for cancer prevention to identify as many people as we can with BRCA mutations. This lovely waterfall is a, is a picture to remind us about cascade testing. This is a cascading waterfall. And it's very important that when someone is found to have a BRCA mutation, that all of their first degree relatives are tested so we can give them proper counseling regarding cancer prevention. Um, one thing that's kind of tricky is when to give PARP inhibitors. So on the bottom right here, there's two scenarios. And the real question is, do you give PARP inhibitors in what's called the maintenance setting? When someone has completed chemotherapy, is now in remission, should they take a PARP inhibitor to keep them in remission as long as possible? until the cancer comes back and then switch to something else? Or should they not take the PARP inhibitor and keep that remission going on its own as much as possible and then start the PARP inhibitor when the cancer does come back? There's reasons to do both, um, both approaches. I'll just say that you know, PARP inhibitors are very well tolerated for many people. On the other hand, they also have side effects for many people. And in one study, about a quarter of the patients on a PARP inhibitor needed to receive a blood transfusion. And that's kind of a big side effect. Instead of doing nothing and, and not being tired and not having an upset stomach, you, you know, could be at the beach or you could be taking a PARP inhibitor. So obviously if the therapy works, we want to give it to people. But the real question is, it, it certainly does work. There's no question about that. But the real question is, do you give it early or do you give it later on? Um, these are basically the three PARP inhibitors that are now FDA approved for the maintenance setting after platinum sensitive recurrence. So that means the cancer has come back the first time usually. It's been treated with platinum. It's gone away again, so it's gone back into remission or the cancer's responding, but typically it goes back into remission or there's a pretty good response. And then what you can see in all these numbers is if you give a PARP inhibitor in this situation to someone who has a BRCA mutation, the benefit is about 10 to 15 months, which is really great. I mean, it's a whole year, uh, which is great. If you give it to someone who doesn't have a BRCA mutation and doesn't have any problems with DNA repair, they really don't work that well. They work very minimally. And that's another controversial area is whether PARP inhibitors should be given to everyone or they should be only given to uh, patients who have a, a BRCA mutation or a tumor that has something like a BRCA mutation. And these are questions that we don't know all the answers to, and, and a lot of this comes down to judgment and having a careful conversation of the risk and benefits, and basically the priorities uh, for, for individuals. Uh, and so my last slide uh, sort of just, just talks, uh, takes us all the way back to initial diagnosis, and there's been lots of great clinical trials that have come out in the past couple of years. I wasn't going to talk about all of them today, uh, but some of the current controversies that we really have no answer to um, is should chemotherapy be given directly into the belly? So we used to think that intraperitoneal chemotherapy or chemotherapy that goes right in the belly was great, um, and it probably is great for some patients and probably is not necessary for some patients. Uh, the second uh, uh, figure here shows 
uh, the question about whether Taxol initially should be given every week on a weekly basis or should be given every three weeks. And we don't have a great answer to that. Um, I think it depends probably whether or not you're receiving bevacizumab at the same time. Uh, and there probably is a benefit to giving paclitaxel uh, every week. And the final uh, graph on the right talks again about bevacizumab. Uh, when should bevacizumab be given? Should it be given initially or later on? Uh, in Europe, it's given a lot of times initially. In the U.S., it's usually given later on. Uh, but these are all controversial areas. And again, if 10 different people gave you 10 different answers, unfortunately, that would be very reasonable. Um, so we don't have all the answers. Uh, we're continuing to work on the answers. Um, a few of the take-home points for tonight is just that neoadjuvant chemotherapy is not superior to primary debulking surgery or cytoreductive surgery. Uh, secondary cytoreduction may prolong progression-free survival, but does not seem to have a benefit to overall survival and has to be used selectively. Uh, combining PARP inhibitors with other agents is very promising. Using immunotherapy by itself is less promising. Uh, drugs are expensive, and, and that's a consideration. Um, and here at the NYU Perlmutter Cancer Center, we have many phase two and phase three clinical trials for ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, and uh, cervical cancer. A lot of the data that I presented tonight uh, was work done by others. Uh, probably all of it was work done by others. Um, I don't think I played a role in necessarily the studies that I, that I talked about. Um, my research involves a lot of preclinical work and cancer prevention uh, and rare tumors and, and things with uh, precision medicine. Um, and so I thank all the speakers who, who uh, contributed the slides to the public domain and anyone who I stole slides from. Uh, and finally, it does take a big group. Uh, this is my um, clinical group here at NYU. This is my laboratory. Uh, we just built a brand new hospital that opened a few months ago. It's all single-bedded rooms. It's the first single-bedded room hospital uh, in New York City. It uh, has a beautiful view of the East River and the Empire State Building. Uh, but, but all this work really takes the village, both you know, of the doctors, the scientists, and most importantly, the patients. And really, I think most of us, particularly in my group, we really consider uh, this to be a partnership. Um, and we're working together, uh, patient and doctor, to try to have the best outcome for each individual person and as a group uh, trying to uh, expand what science can do to help uh, patients overall. So uh, thank you again for listening uh, and joining us tonight, and I'd be happy to take any questions. My wife here who has stage 4 ovarian cancer, and I got the impression that the early trials in immunotherapy or the actual FDA-approved immunotherapy with that 8% figure is not promising. And yet a lot of us have been holding our breath waiting for something big to happen in that area. Is anything big going to happen in immunotherapy for ovarian cancer? So that's a very good summary. Um, and. Immunotherapy has been very exciting for many types of cancers, including for some endometrial cancers. It has not yet been very exciting for ovarian cancer. Um, it has a lot of potential, and what we're trying to figure out now is why is it that immunotherapy does not work as well for ovarian cancer um, as it has worked in, in other uh, cancers. There's some really great people doing some really great work, and that's where the combination therapies come in. Um, so going from 8 to 25%, I mean, that's a three-fold improvement with the combination with PARP inhibitors. Um, so that's one promising. Um, and, and again, that's in a population of people who are, you know, have received many lines of therapy. So you could imagine, you know, if we gave it earlier, it would probably work even better. Um, so I don't think we're going to see the big immunotherapy advance in the near future. I think it's going to take a lot of uh, work with combination drugs, both targeting different aspects of the immune system and putting it together um, with, uh, with other types of uh, treatments. Dr. Levine, um, uh, one thing that you didn't mention was that uh, if there's a BRCA mutation that's somatic, the germline uh -huh. blood testing is not going to show up. Right. And you need to have your tumor analyzed, and the Clarity Foundation does that. Right. So a 
couple of things there. So we were talking about prevention. I was, I was talking about BRCA mutations mostly in the context of prevention, in which case it is only the blood test BRCA mutations or the inherited ones called germline mutations. But you're completely correct that uh, about, six, about, five to, about 5 to 10 percent of tumors will have what's called a somatic mutation, which is just in the tumor. It's not inherited. It can't be transmitted to children, um, but it does result in a response to PARP inhibitors. And so we do have tests to do that nowadays. Clarity Foundation actually doesn't do the testing. Um, they can help people get testing. Um, they're also extremely helpful in interpreting the testing. The testing, the, the, doing the testing nowadays is actually not that difficult. Um, interpreting it is really hard for both patients and doctors. And so the Clarity Foundation can be very helpful in interpreting those tests and, and letting you know what the important questions are to ask and also contributing to their research to try to figure out how to combine the, uh, the results uh, with the proper um, treatments. And so, so very good point. So somatic mutations are different than germline mutations. They both result in response to PARP inhibitors, but only germline mutations can be inherited. Dr. Levine, um, as, as someone who is a uh, garden type variety, got no anything uh, exotic, including BRCA, what do you know about Dervalumab and its being studied? Dervalumab is another immune checkpoint blockade inhibitor by another company. Um, it is one that's had a slightly more promising results, but not, um, not, I wouldn't certainly call it a home run. So it's just another immunotherapy um, being tested, and it, it probably also is being tested by, uh, with other combinations. Uh, there was one report for Devalimab about a year or so ago. Um, I haven't seen anything lately reported in ovarian cancer, but I'm quite confident there are ongoing studies. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Levine, can you talk a little bit about aromatase inhibitors and adding those in? Um, MCHC3C primary peritoneal. I have been on just about, I think, everything you mentioned and then some. Um, and now I'm on Avastin maintenance and they, they want to add in a, um, an aromatase inhibitor. Sure. So the main um, sort of breakthrough or new knowledge with aromatase inhibitors is actually in low-grade serous carcinoma, which I didn't talk about at all. So low-grade serous carcinoma um, is a pretty rare type of ovarian cancer. It, it can affect younger people. It can um, come back over a long period of time. Um, but, but about two, I think it was two years ago, maybe three years ago, uh, David Gershenson from MD Anderson has really been one of the experts and, and leaders in this particular area, um, reported on a very large retrospective series of women who were treated for low-grade serous carcinoma. And then after the treatment as a maintenance therapy, like we were talking about, some took an aromatase inhibitor and some did not. And those that took the aromatase inhibitor uh, seemed to have the cancer stay away for a much longer period of time. And so now for low-grade serous carcinoma, this is becoming a standard of care um, that many of us are using. For high-grade serous carcinoma, it's much less clear how effective an aromatase inhibitor is. It's not a bad treatment. Um, uh, you know, a lot of cancers do express estrogen receptors, which is uh, one well, of the... I, I, am, I am estrogen positive. My tumor tissue was, you know, was tested by Karis, and I actually yeah. spoken to, to Clarity a uh, number of times, so... Yeah. So, so again, a lot of high-grade serous carcinomas mm -hmm. will express the estrogen receptor. It doesn't mean that the estrogen targeting drugs work that well. And so that's one of the shortcomings of some of the, some of the molecular testing platforms, like you mentioned, is that you know, they'll do a test and it'll seem like a drug should work, but that has not been tested in the clinical trial. And so it does make logical sense. Um, but there aren't studies to show, you know, if you took an aromatase inhibitor versus a placebo, how much better would it work? Now, it may work, and so people try that, and you're trying that, and I certainly hope that it does work, but we don't have data to suggest that just based on the estrogen receptor 
positivity in high-grade serous carcinoma because there's so many other things going on um, that the aromatase inhibitors are highly effective. Having said that, we often use them when people um, have a little bit of cancer coming back, maybe if the CA125 is going up but there's no clear okay. evidence of disease, maybe yeah. in combination with something else like you're doing, um, that yeah, can make yeah, sense, but we just haven't really done those trials. Okay. So, yeah, that's exactly where I am is, is my number is up, it's still normal, and now they want to put something else in to possibly quell it. Right. That's really where, why clinical trials are so important. And so, you know, whatever happens to you is great, you know, hopefully will be great, but we don't know if that's just the natural history of your particular cancer or is it because you actually took, you know, the aromatase inhibitor. And if someone else didn't take it, would the marker go up, you know, just as quickly or just as slowly? And that's really why it's so important for us to conduct and for patients to help us uh, run clinical trials so we know these answers. And because, as you know, aromatase inhibitors have side effects. They give you joint pain. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, they're pretty well tolerated, but some people have to stop them. And if they're ineffective, you wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to take it. But we really won't know that unless a clinical trial is performed. Okay. Thanks. The chat question is, when do you think CAR-T cell therapy will have a receptor that is useful in ovarian mm -hmm. cancer? So. I think this is a question about CAR T cell therapy. So CAR T cells are chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And these are really engineered T cells um, that can be designed for a specific tumor. Um, and these actually have been very promising, but they're very difficult to make and we can't make them in large quantities yet. Um, and they haven't been extensively tested, but there's some very promising results from a very small number of patients. Um, this is a completely different type of immunotherapy than um, than what what was than what we've been talking about with, with the checkpoint blockade. That's why all immunotherapy is not the same. Um, this type of immunotherapy is very tricky and complicated, uh, but so far it has been promising. Can we get it to work for everyone? Can it be safe? Uh, there's certainly some toxicity. Um, there's a couple of trials going on. University of Pennsylvania has been some of the leaders in this area, as has uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering sort of just getting their program uh, up and running in the clinical side for ovarian cancer. They're doing a lot of stuff in other cancers. Um, and so these are great studies. Um, I would encourage anyone to go on them if they're um, eligible. It's a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of blood transfusions and, and things like that. Um, but they ha there has been some promise to CAR T cell therapy so far. We have time for more questions, folks. Um, Dr. Levine, I was wondering, I've heard about, uh, maybe it's uh, just beginning trials, but uh, molecular profiling for ovarian cancer. I know mm -hmm. they've done it for breast cancer. Do you know anything about that? Well, that's sort of what we've been talking about throughout, you know, so even just testing the tumors for BRCA mutations, that's a form of molecular profiling. We now, we now can measure, you know, three or 400 genes at the same time and develop a molecular profile. For high-grade serous carcinoma, the truth is that we often don't find useful targets. And so we, we do that for our patients, and it's often, it's most of the time, covered by insurance. Um, the important thing now is to find those somatic BRCA mutations because that makes PARP inhibitors very effective. And so I, I think pretty soon at diagnosis, everyone's going to have germline and somatic testing for BRCA mutations and a few other things because there's a new study called SOLO1 um, that's going to be reported probably next month that has already been reported vaguely as being positive, and that's really using a PARP inhibitor um, for initial uh, maintenance therapy. Um, and if that truly is positive, uh, a lot of people with BRCA mutations will get a PARP inhibitor, you know, almost right away after, after finishing uh, initial treatment. And so I think early on, as soon as, you know, people are really diagnosed and on chemotherapy, we're going to be doing germline and somatic BRCA testing and probably molecular profiling at the same time. Thank you. Dr. Levine, do you need a live tumor or, you know, in order to do molecular uh, testing? You don't need a lot, but you need 
some, and so every so often the testing will fail because there's not enough tumor available. Um, certainly anyone who's had a major operation has more than enough tumor. Um, it is a little tricky to do it off of biopsy specimens. If someone, like a CT-guided biopsy or a needle biopsy, that can be tricky. It, it often will work, but sometimes it'll fail. Sometimes, you know, if you really want to have it done, you could have a repeat biopsy, and if you're doing a biopsy just for that purpose, usually we can get enough tissue. So you have to have cancer. You have to have be not in the Well, you're remission. only you're you're only doing the profiling of the cancer, but you can use a specimen that was collected previously. So if you had cancer at some point and it was removed, there is a specimen somewhere that can be profiled. If you're actually in remission, you know, usually we don't recommend Doing the pro, I don't recommend doing the profile in, in remission because you're not going to use that information. And both the test, the test and the tumor can change over time. So the test we're doing nowadays is very different than what we were doing a year or two ago. And so it makes most sense to do the test when you're going to use that information for treatment. Thank you. On the part, what is the target uh, uh, that is being attacked? Is it, is it what Wistar came up with uh, two summers ago? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? When they do the CAR-T um, uh, targeted um, therapy, what, uh, what's the target that the, um, that the, the T cells are attacking? There's many uh, different targets, and, and people are making different types of CAR T cells that do target different things that are on the tumors. Um, you know, so CA125 is a target, uh, WT1 is a target. You can also make um, sort of your own targets through something called adoptive T cell therapy, where you actually can take the tumor cells and mix them with the T cells, and then that cancer will target your own tumor, which is possibly one of the most promising approaches that's, that's coming up. Hmm. You, um, Dr. Lamy mentioned about it, it, the disease keeps changing. So with each recurrence, it's not exact. It's not the same disease. Right. So what happens is early on the um, disease, when there's a lot of cancer, the disease is very heterogeneous, and there's lots of different what are called clones, um, and uh, there's lots of different mutations and different uh, parts of the tumor. And what the chemotherapy does, it basically selects for the bad stuff. So the good stuff gets killed. Very, the, good, the good cancer cells die. And I say they're good because they're dying. And we want, we want the cancer cells to die so they're behaving. And so you, the chemotherapy will kill all the cancer cells that are easy to kill. But then there's a small number that are resistant or that will hide from the chemotherapy. And then over time, that small population will grow back, and then that will now become the dominant population. So if you give the same drug right away, it's not going to work because the cancer cells that have survived are the ones that have survived from that chemotherapy drug. And so that's why you have to give a different chemotherapy drug to target the cells that are already hiding from the first chemotherapy drug. Then if that second drug works, maybe all those cells will die, but now the ones that grow back might be sensitive to the first drug. And so we do recycle some drugs over time because the cancer population can change under what's called selection from the chemotherapy agents. So if I have tumor tissue stored from a surgery... Okay, from I'm going to head out now. <laughs> oh, that's not... Just so to finish up that... So one person was asking about when to send the tumor specimen. So we don't know how much the cancer changes, and we don't know whether the important things are changing. Um, and so, um, so it, it makes sense to send the test when you're ready to use it, because sometimes people have a second operation. It probably doesn't make sense to have a biopsy just for that purpose. Um, because the, the, the bits that change that are going to affect the treatment um, are probably pretty limited. Um, so we can use previous tumor specimens when needed. So again, I, I have one really important question, doctor, and if you choose not to answer, I understand. We talk about a lot of treatments, percentages, trials, et cetera. 
We don't talk about cure. When you look down the road, are we talking years, decades, or never? Uh, if I think I understand your question, it's, it's, you know, are people being cured and when will they be cured? Um, so advanced ovarian cancer is hard to cure. Um, it's not impossible, though. I do talk about cure with my patients. Um, we, we know a lot of factors that are associated with, with what I call long-term survivor, survival, okay? So we know that if you live five years, that does not equal being cured. And that's a good thing because a lot of people are living five to ten years now, whereas a decade ago, that was not the case. So I'm quite confident that people are living longer and better with ovarian cancer, longer is pretty self-explanatory. Better, I mean that the treatments are better tolerated now than they used to be. So people are living longer and better, and that's good, and not good enough. Um, I do think that if, uh, if you live 10 years without your cancer coming back, there's a very good chance you're cured. And we published a paper about 10-year survivors uh, maybe a year or two ago, and we found that of the people who were alive 10 years after a diagnosis, about half of them never had a recurrence, and half of them had one or more recurrences. Um, and so there's, there's definitely some patients with advanced stage ovarian cancer who are cured today, and we have some idea as to who's more likely to be cured from advanced ovarian cancer. Early stage ovarian cancer is much more curable, and I would almost say early stage ovarian cancer is highly curable. Um, but since advanced stage ovarian cancer is so is difficult to cure, not impossible, but difficult, um, our, some of our biggest advantages will come from prevention. So if we prevent ovarian cancer, no one has to worry about being cured because you won't get it. And so it's going to be a combination of efforts. It's going to be better prevention. It's going to be better treatments. Um, we may see some cures with some combinations. I really don't know if that's going to happen in three years or 30 years. Um, and I also think there's a, a possibility that we're working on other methods of early detection so that we can detect the cancer at an earlier stage when it's more curable. That's also very difficult. But the, the biggest uh, uh, benefit right now is in prevention, where we can prevent cancer from women who are at high risk and possibly others so they never have to get cancer and don't have to ask that question. Thank you, doctor. Okay, and Dr. Levine, I'd like to thank you for this great presentation, your passion, dedication, and commitment to the ovarian cancer community, and to all of you folks for coming out tonight and taking the time to become educated on this very important topic. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, thank everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.